Hello and welcome to episode four of series three of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. This is the show for employee engagers and internal communicators who like to keep up to date with all that is new in our profession. My name's Craig Smith from The Big Picture People. I hope you're finding this current series of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast useful and inspiring, and we're giving you lots of ideas and thoughts about how you can improve employee engagement and internal communications in your organization. So I want to make you aware of a few things. So coming up in the next episode, which will be on the 15th of March, which is episode number five, we will have an interview with Richard Nugent. Now, this originally went out as a LinkedIn live event that we ran uh, a few weeks ago. So we are now going to be using the audio from that LinkedIn live event, which was a conversation between myself and Richard, which was all about hopeful into internal communications. Uh, and that was all basically around the, the concept that we need to build hope and optimi optimism into our internal communications, particularly at this current moment in time, as we we are hopefully emerging from the pandemic. Um, we had a great conversation, Richard and myself, and uh, we, we'd like to share that with you via the podcast because it was it was so good that uh, it was made for sharing, as it were. So, um, and on that note, we are running another LinkedIn Live event on the 23rd of March in a few weeks' time, which you are more than welcome to sign up for and attend. So if you don't know how LinkedIn Live works, basically we'll be having a facilitator conversation between myself and I'll tell you what the, the the topic of the the event the next event is in a moment but it's basically a live a live video stream where we'll be talking and sharing ideas uh, with, with two guests on this occasion so that's on the 23rd of March and the topic about the, uh, the that event is going to be talking about menopause and midlife so what we're going to be looking at that uh, menopause isn't just a gender issue or an age issue it's something that impacts colleagues both both indirectly and directly, and is something that should be considered as an organisational issue. Uh, some really interesting statistics for you to maybe think about is that 99% of women stated that menopause has impacted on, on their work. 59% that have said that they have had to take off time because of menopause symptoms, and also 12% have, have said that they've resigned as a direct result. And so organisations do need to do something about that, and part of that is starting to talk about it, particularly men. Men need to start talking about this and recognising the role that they play in supporting female colleagues who are experiencing menopause. So I'm not an expert on that, but we are going to be including two experts in the session. One of those is Carolyn Hobdy. And the other is Dave Algio. Now we're talking, we we're, we're framing this around menopause and midlife because it, it, it's something that we want to make as inclusive as possible for, for 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 everyone in terms of you know regardless of gender. So we're going to be looking at midlife issues in general that that we will all face at some point in our lives or are all facing in in our lives perhaps now, uh, and how organisations need to change the conversation and start talking about them. So if you want to find out how to sign up for that or become uh, aware of of where you can watch that stream you need to go to uh, uh, LinkedIn and if you go to my profile now if you're not connected to me don't worry but if you search talking about menopause and midlife as an event and that is, you'll see that was created by me Craig Smith that will be uh, on the, um, uh, the 23rd of March and that will be at 2 p.m. UK time so that's just to be aware it's a UK time zone that we will be putting that out at 2 p.m. in the afternoon you can add that to your calendar. You can sign up to uh, to, to watch that, and um, hopefully you'll find that a, a really in interesting event. I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. As I said, it's an area that is uh, is not talked about as much as it should be, and that's kind of where we we like to support organisations to help them to have those conversations that they don't know how to have. So uh, yeah, and then 
a couple of our own events to be aware of. Uh, if you're very quick and you're listening to this in real time, uh, in a couple of days' time on the 3rd of March, we're running another one of our free webinars, which is Transforming Health and Health and Safety Communication and Training. We're going to be looking at how you can make your health and safety training and communications more interesting, more exciting, more about hearts and minds, and uh, really, really giving them some of the attention that they deserve and not just the usual death by PowerPoint. And then looking forward into a few weeks in the future, but you can sign up for this now. We are running another webinar on the 28th of April, which is our helping employees understand the organ- your organization's big picture webinar, which is all about helping leaders to understand the challenges of sharing the big picture and helping their employees to really understand and buy into that big picture, whether that's your vision, your values, your strategy, all of the different elements that we think about when we're talk- talking about big picture. So um, that's on the 28th of April. Both of those are at 3 p.m. UK time, 3 o'clock in the afternoon UK time. And you can find both of those events if you go to our website, thebigpicturepeople.co.uk, at the top of the screen, you'll see our events tab. If you click on that, it'll show you all of the events that we've got coming up in the next few months. Uh, those two, the 3rd of March and the 28th of April, and then also going into the summer, you'll see our summer events also on there as well. So that is that for events. The only other thing that I wanted to make you aware of is that we are still talking and hoping that people are filling in our pulse check survey, which is a diagnostic you can use to to understand, so self-diagnose from an organizational perspective, where some of the challenges might be in terms of helping people understand where you're heading, what your values are, what your strategies are, how, how clear people can see an alignment between their role and what the organization is trying to do. It's a simple diagnostic you can complete, take takes about 15 minutes to complete and at the end of it you'll get a very comprehensive 30 page pdf report that we'll email through to you obviously you'll need to tell us your email address at the end of the survey so we can do that and uh, we'll send that through to you and you will get a scorecard with some ideas of ways you can improve on the areas that you've identified as opportunities but also some some ideas about how you can get even better in those that you're already doing pretty well so to access that you need to go to www pulse-check.co.uk so that's www.pulse- hyphen or dash dot uh, pulse <laughs> pulse hyphen or dash check.co.uk so just to be clear www.pulse- hyphen check.co.uk right that's absolutely enough of me let's get on to this episode's interview <laughs> As internal communicators and employee engagers, we probably all recognise the importance of having our leadership teams on board and demonstrating their belief and conviction in the messages that we're communicating to the rest of the organisation. Helping our leaders walk the talk is an area that I wanted to explore on the podcast and really look at what we can do to make sure that there are no hidden messages, contradictions and potentially undermining those internal communications messages that we are sharing with our employees through our channels through the behaviours and actions of our leaders. So on today's interview, we're going to be exploring this in more detail. I think it's vitally important and throughout my career, one of the challenges that I've had has been in order to get get our leaders and the leaders who I've been working with to really recognize that it's not just what they say, it's what they do that is, has a massive impact on how credible those messages are. And that's what we're going to be looking at in today's interview. And uh, I'd be really interested to get your viewpoints on this. And if you, you do have any uh, particular opinions or examples of, of, of what we're going to be talking about in this interview that you'd like to share with us as ever, please let us know if, if you can share that via our uh, sign up form at engagingic.com. Um, we'd love to get some of your own experiences of this and, and in, indeed on any of the interviews that we put out. Um, that That is what that sign up form is there for. It's for comments, suggestions, and then we, we can possibly read those out on the show or share them anonymously if that's what you wish. So anyway, walking the talk and helping our leaders walk the talk is what this interview is all about. And I hope you enjoy it. 
My guest today is Dean Batson, who is an educator and internal communicator to students at colleges in Arizona. Prior to this, Dean had an extensive career in marketing and internal communications at a wide range of organizations spanning industries such as technology, gaming, agriculture, and higher education. Dean prides himself as a champion for organizational communication, coffee, motivating employees, scaling stuff, impactful efforts, and bullet points. So I'm going to cut straight to the chase, Dean. Hello, are you? And what is the weather like in Arizona at the moment? Hey, Craig, I'm doing really well. And the weather question always gets me because it's beautiful right now. I feel like it's a it's going to karma and I'm going to pay back when summertime comes. Right now, it's about uh, it's going to be in the 60s and sunny today. Fantastic. I've always got this vision of Arizona of it being blue skies all the time, but I'm sure I'm sure it's it's not always like that, but it sounds like it is the majority of the time, yeah. The majority of the time. <laughs> Brilliant. So if we can just kick off, Dean, um I, as I said in the introduction there, you 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 you'd started your career out in sort of marketing internal comms and you've now you've now moved into uh high, in higher education. Um tell me a little bit about how you made that transition because I think that's always an interesting transition to make and 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 why you did it and how you're finding it in uh, in education compared to corporate life uh i would say that my move is uh came about from three seemingly unrelated factors i worked in high education as a marketing communications uh person doing yeah. engagement for alumni and for students and for, for that realm and when i was in that i would work with students perspective perspective students alumni non-traditional students and i was privy to the struggles that students would have, um, you know, completing and graduating. And I, yeah. I, I would see that. So, uh, so you take that, you put it to the side. And then I've also been sensitive to the nuances and experience in hiring people and um, the struggles, especially in the US, you know, that we have with that. Third, all these things seem unrelated, um, yeah. is I'm constantly <laughs> astounded at organizations, companies, universities, and so on, that they tout the essential importance of communication yet they fail to really live it or even include efforts on improving it. So these factors motivated me to want to uh, teach communication to students so they can realize the importance and become experts and bring it into the corporate or you know, professional world when they graduate. So those are the things that you know, got me to where I am. Fantastic. Today. Yeah. So like a perfect storm of, 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 uh, realization and, and then wanting to make a difference. So that, that's, that's brilliant. And, exactly. and, what, and, and, and obviously with higher education, you're working with sort of post school, you know, post college uh, students, sort of, uh, late teens, early twenties. Is that sort of, uh, uh, the, the people you're working with? Uh, y- yes. So, uh, that's a, uh, I would say a majority and I'm a, a little leery to use that word because a lot of what I've done is um, is marketing continuum professional education. And so that got me connected with non-traditional students. And I started okay. realizing there's these students that are uh, 40 years old. They have three, four kids they're, that they're raising by themselves. They, you know, they have a full-time job. And so it really, uh, it's, it's very motivating for me to, to try and help them um, and, and get them, you know, so they have their, their first degree and often cases it's the first, uh, degree ever in their entire family. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's, that's brilliant. Um, so what, what I want, we were going to be talking about today is we've this sort of nominally working title of this episode is helping leaders walk the talk. And, and I think what we, we wanted to, what I wanted to explore with you is this idea that, that, that leadership buy-in for transformational change. And, um, and we, 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 we had the pre conversation before we, uh, before the interview, we were chatting about the fact that both of our sort of mutual experiences that is that often our, our leaders are, are, are kind of carrying the flag for a change that they don't really apparently believe in themselves or when when you dig behind it they don't they're kind of uh, it, it's sort of uh, compliance rather than conviction from their point of view so do you want to give me your your perspective on that and and some of the challenges that you've seen in your career and and, and some of the educational work that you're doing at the moment uh, yes. Yeah, so this is a, a great time to talk about that. Uh, I think you, you had phrased it earlier as leaders um, walking the talk. Yeah. And so right now in, in the U.S. at least, uh, there's three examples of transformational change that are on fire. Um, mm. And it's um, 
where where leaders are often resistant to real change. Uh, one of them is DEI efforts, which uh, you and I had discussion. I think you you in the UK you call DI efforts, which for us is diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion efforts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other one is uh, the hiring struggle. We we have a, a big hiring uh, employment you know challenge right now in the US. And the third is uh, remote work. So those three topics are uh, ones that are forcing leaders to make changes. And so as a communicator, we have to um, communicate these changes. And one of the problems that uh, that I come across is that they're inauthentic. Um, mm. And if I could, I, I, uh, I'll just break those three examples down. And so if you take uh, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, we have to ask how impactful is that effort when it, it the communication effort for uh, internal communicators to share this message to the employees of, of a, a small, medium, a large organization when they know um, that it's really not uh, what the company believes. Mm. And so that's something that uh, I see a lot. And so we have to then get these, you know, these leaders on board because they, you know, they simply uh, might not be. One of the uh, examples is I, I think that we had talked about is there was um, a um, I, I personally was in a meeting right before COVID and the CMO said uh, hey everybody I'm really sorry uh, we have to do this DEI training I know you're all busy and it really killed the the you know the training yeah. before it ever started yeah uh, so that that's an important thing that how do we overcome that. Um, then when it comes to hiring in the U.S., I'm not sure about the U.K., right now it's a disaster. We have uh, companies struggling from frontline employees, say restaurants, all the way up to professional where they can't, they can't fill positions. Right. And so there's, there's a structural change that needs to take place, and that's not really happening. And mm. so um, when we advertise like, hey, we're hiring, and we put how great we are to hire – but yet we haven't changed to meet the needs of what the environment is. Uh, again, it comes across as um, inauthentic. Mm, uh, mm. The last uh, example is I've been uh, involved directly and then <clears throat> uh, had read uh, several incidents where a lot of these organizations, rightly so, they'll put out surveys about remote work. Hey, everybody, what do you think of remote? Do you want to come back? Do you want to do this? And inevitably, they're all a vast majority where they simply, they don't want to come back to the office uh, mm -hmm. like they did prior. However, a lot of these organizations already made the decision that they're going to make everybody come back. So now mm -hmm. you have a, a survey that was uh, available to, that everybody knows about in the company. They know the results were overwhelmingly that they don't want to come back, yet the organization's already moving forward saying you got to come back. Those yeah. are challenges that we uh, we have to go back to leaders and we have to uh, guide them and help them along the path to change. Yeah, yeah. No, I, it's really interesting. I think I think it's interesting. That, you know the parallels there. And I mean, I mean that last one you talked about there. I think you know. I think remote is obviously the the most contemporary example of that. But I've seen in my career, and I'm sure you you, you know you have your, yourself. Is that a lot of this? Uh, we ask you a question, and then we kind of ignore the answer and do what we were always yeah. going to do anyway, mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, and I, you know, I used to see this a lot in my corporate career, which is you know the traditional set piece employee survey, where you know the company asks lots of questions, but wasn't particularly good at then responding to what people were actually saying I would just take it on, on face value what the what you know the kind of binary yes no answers or the percentages and not actually dig behind that and say well why are people really thinking that or feeling that or or as you, you know as we've said you just kind of say okay well yeah okay but they don't really understand so we'll just do what we we're going to do anyway um, yes yeah yeah and i and i think that that ultimately well, not immediately build skepticism and cynicism as well, you know, and all, almost as I always used to believe and still believe is that it's, it's it's worse than asking, not asking people in the first place to ask them and then ignore them is is worse than you know. It's like idea schemes and uh, and kaizen and that sort of thing. If you're asking people to kind of come up with ideas of how they can do their job better and then you just ignore them, then you're probably better off just never to bothered in the first place. And, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I agree. Uh, the the hiring I'm I'm kind of doing these in reverse order the hiring thing again it's an interesting one that and and what what are you what are some of the things because uh, in the UK we have a huge challenge with that as well at the minute and it's partly down to the fact that 
n- not a lot of the jobs that are vacant at the moment nobody wants to do and that's partly because they're seen as you know kind of low skill low low opportunity but also we've got sort of issues with you know kind of uh, now we've left the european union that sort of thing uh, without going into that i mean what what are some of the drivers of, of of these 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 hiring issues in the states then i mean you kind of implied that that was because you know we're kind of not giving people the places they want to work is that partly behind it or what, what what's driving that those those sort of uh, gaps at the moment uh, yeah. So the the first thing that you mentioned about uh, there's some jobs people just don't want, right? So that mm. that's happening here also. Mm. Uh, the other part is uh, there's so many people that are looking for another job, even if they're if they're out of work or if they're having a job. Mm. You know, they're mm. calling it here. They're great res- resignation. There's yeah. a lot of people that are looking to to completely change their their career for uh, a number of reasons. So what's happening is we haven't changed our process yet. The um, the amount of candidates and the amount of people looking for a job and the amount of jobs open um, are struggling to connect these two things. Uh, there's a there's a recruiter that I, I'm friends with. I became friends with over a decade ago, and him and I check in occasionally. And so I asked him just to, about you know six weeks ago, like what's this the status and um, his struggle because he works for different you know organizations. His struggle is that they won't change that they want to hire the you know, for these, fill these professional positions, but mm. on average, it's taken three months plus yeah. and they have uh, on average eight interviews. So what's happening is he's seeing all these, um, these potential, you know, candidates coming through and they're interviewing one, two, three, all the way up to eight times. And it's taken many months. And by the time the company's making a decision, that person has already taken some other jobs six weeks right, earlier. Right. Um, okay. And so that's one of the, the things uh, that's really holding all this up. And, and I see this, um, time and time again. And I consult with a number of different people and I struggle to get them to change their process to yeah. say, you know what, don't do eight interviews, do three interviews. Uh, mm-hmm. and it, it's, it's one of those things that I have to work on leading them to change. Yeah. 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 So the leadership element there then is there's this reluctance to actually acknowledge that we've got an issue and sort it out and do something, uh, you know, kind of meaningful about that. Yeah. Uh, yes. And yeah. so um, what, the, one of the oddities about, you know, uh, hiring is, is right, is um, organizations often don't share the salary. Mm. And so candidates don't ever ask the salary. It's this unspoken mm. uh, thing that we don't do. But now, um, according to, you know, the recruiter that I checked with, he's like, they're all asking upfront, I want to know what the salary is and I want to yeah. know what the remote policy is. And so yeah. the companies that won't accommodate these two questions, the candidates aren't pursuing it and they're just moving elsewhere. Yeah, and so yeah. that's uh, important things that, that leadership has to say, hey, this is what it is. We need to address this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I definitely concur with that. And and then sort of moving back through reverse order, the 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 the, the DEI or the DNI um, point that you mentioned, I think, is obviously a really massive issue at the minute, and globally as well as in in the state. So you, I think, you had some some data that you 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 will put in the in the show notes from an article about. Um, some of the, the the kind of manifest some of the issues there. Do you, I mean, do you want to just talk through that that DNI uh, a DEI sort of um, challenge that, that you, you talked about at the, at the beginning of those three points that we just discussed? Uh, yes. So the, this particular example just illustrates it real well. There was an article I read. It's not. It's you know not 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 that old, and you could put it in the notes and link to it. Yeah. Uh, it was in Inc. Magazine, which was based on a study, a report from an organization called Levers, yeah. uh, where they surveyed more than a thousand employees and uh, about five hundred um, HR decision makers. And so, what it was is that uh, just about a hundred percent of the HR decision makers they had stated that their company is doing um, you know these great things for DEI measures. Mm. Uh, however, only about a third of the employees at the same companies had any idea that they were doing anything. Mm. Um, and so there's two pieces to that to consider is, is it just a communication issue where they are really truly doing something and it hasn't been communicated to, to employees or is it that they're really not doing anything or it's in a, inauthentic efforts or they're really just, you know, checking a box and there's no real, real, you know, real feeling behind those efforts. Yeah. And, and, and what we call you, we, we maybe some of the terms to you window dressing, it's kind of, you know, it's sort of, uh, making it look right, good and proper, but actually behind the scenes, there's, there's lots of issues. And I guess a lot of organizations that you hear at the minute about, you know, endemic, uh, you know, whether it's based around gender or race or what 
whatever that that you know that that a lot of organisations that sort of institutionally got some big issues. I mean, what of those two? Which are you are you leaning in towards, or is it a combination of both? Do you think? I, I'm leaning towards that. It's inauthentic. Um, yeah. There, there, there's um, another uh, story that you and I referenced earlier. There was uh, uh, a large healthcare system in Texas, a very large healthcare system in Texas, uh, hired their first um, DEI officer, and and that uh, that person who was hired, his job was rescinded a day or two or three before he started because he had uh, hi- he was relocating the whole bit. He had highlighted uh, a few. Um, you know, shortcomings. And yeah. what happened is the, the company had told them you're too sensitive to racial issues. Okay. Um, yeah. And so that's to me is indicative of where we are. Like they, like a lot of companies want to do this. Um, and yet they either don't know how, or they don't know if they really want to, you know, make the, the change that they need to in there after uh, in the U S after the, the George Floyd murder, there mm. was uh there has been record numbers of donations to uh to minority based nonprofits and funds in in the billions of dollars more so than ever for, ever before so that looks great but however the number of of black dei directors in us companies has not grown yeah. at all it's been stagnant yeah. so yeah. when the rubber meets the road it's like well we're not making those you know, those changes. Yeah. 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 And, and, and yeah, I mean, I, again, it's, it's not an area I have a huge amount of, 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 of knowledge or expertise around other than, you know, kind of just listening and watching the media. But I, I, I agree. I think it is, it's much deeper than that. So, so I guess if we're looking then at one of the, the natural conclusion around this is that, you know, we have kind of a, a leadership population, you know, and we're generalizing here who, who, you know, kind of saying the right things, but not necessarily really always walking the talk um you know how is this manifesting itself and and what i guess you know now kind of drilling down now into well what can we do because it's you know it's it's uh, it's the sort of stephen covey stuff isn't it it's like what we can what we can actually influence and change versus what we just concerned around and i guess you know we all want to be able to make a make some genuine impact on these areas what what is what are some of the things you're perceiving as the way that we can help these leaders to not only you know kind of uh, say what we want them to say and and smile when we want them to smile but actually start to to buy into some of this stuff and really kind of expose them to some of the realities of the problem as it that it, as it exists so that's the crux of the of the situation so first you had asked uh, how is it manifesting itself one of the ways i see that it's manifesting is that uh communication um content is less impactful when the audience doesn't buy it. And that yeah. uh, that taints all other communications. So for example, if it's just DEI efforts and we're communicating uh, how great we're doing, but yet uh, none of our audience, none of the employees really buy it, that lessens our credibility for all other uh, messaging. So that's mm-hmm. how it manifests itself. Uh, then like, uh, how do we move the dial on it? Um, I think that's uh, that's the important thing. And that's one of the things that I, I try and work on. Mm. Um, I think uh, there's a, a few things that I highlighted. The first one is sh- is straightforward. Is we have to show the data and how it directly relates to the goal of. I'll, I'll just use the CEO as an example. How mm. it relates to the goal of the CEO. Sometimes a CEO's goal is a bit different than maybe what the organization goal is. So we have to, uh, as a as a leader, we have to be able to decipher that and be able to speak so we can persuade them. We have to connect the, and then we have to connect the dots for them on how that those efforts, uh, that, let's just say DEI, these D, DEI efforts, how the bottom line is going to, you know, positively, positively impact them and their goals. Mm, mm. We have to be able to, you know, to show that data. Yeah. Uh, so that, so just, so just just pausing there, and so that that basically what we're saying there is we need to we need to step into their shoes and relate. Uh, you know, this kind of uh, the the more the kind of global thing that we're trying to influence them through. We have to kind of relate it to how that's going to help them. You know, whether it's the bottom line or whatever their their own personal motivators are. It's about sort of stepping into their shoes and kind of seeing it through their eyes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And one of the ways to be more impactful for that is you know we kind of have to go back to our 
uh, communication 101, um, we have to get alignment from other leaders because, uh, you know, people in general are more favorable to change when they see other like people on board. Mm, uh, yeah. So I think it's it's important to uh, to get alignment from, you know, from a number of, of leaders, you know, before or as we're going to try and um, uh, affect this, you know, transformational change. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another real important part is uh, we have to illustrate a way to make them feel and experience the problem. Mm. Uh, so graphs are pretty and they're informative. However, the data needs to be presented in a way where it humanizes the people it represents. Mm. Uh, these are real people that are, have real issues associated with this uh, data and this pretty graph. And we have to connect those uh, and let somebody you know feel that. Uh, you and I talked about an example that's always been something I filter a lot of what I do through. And that was during a, a, a course called Big Data and F Social Physics that I took. We mm. discussed a case about um, the city of Boston that uh, employed an app development company to build an app uh, mm. called Bump. And mm. so that utilizes the phone's accelerometer to record bumps as people drove. And the intent was to have enough uh, people download the app and it ran in the background. And as they did their daily chores, commuting to work and the grocery store and whatever, <clears throat> it would um, map all the potholes in the city. And the mm. technology worked uh, well enough and people adopted it that it was a, a su it successfully mapped uh, potholes, which the city prioritized. However, there was a crucial failing. The, the socioeconomic divide between the people who downloaded the app and those who did not was significant. And so the app essentially mapped potholes in affluent areas and mm. did not alert any to economically stressed areas. Mm -hmm. So here we have data, which is, you know, which we could illustrate and show how great it is with a heat map of, of potholes. But if we don't look deeper and we don't live that experience of like, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's more to this. There's real people being affected. Their communities are being ignored. Uh, we have to share that experience to help get people to, you know, to move the dial mm. and change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I totally agree. And I mean, we, we talked. Uh, I think that's a really cool, cool story. It's a really good example. I mean, we, we talked when we were, were chatting a few weeks ago about, um, you know, you know, the whole John Cotter and 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 I know you, 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 you we, we discussed this briefly, but the idea that John Cotter sort of talks about in his in his work is that you know analyzing and thinking about change engages your rational thinking, which is important part of of moving people forward. But, but, but. You know, primarily whether we like it or not, we're we're emotional, feeling beings, and and our kind of limbic brains, our you know, need to sort of see and feel stuff to to in order to want us to make it make anything you know to do anything differently or to change something. And I think you know, I'm a great fan of of shows like The Undercover Boss and things like that, where yeah, they actually yeah. you know take people out and sort of you know almost holding them by the scruff of the neck and say, look, this is yeah. what it's really like for our customers, for our employees. What are you going to do about it? And feel some of the sort of you know the the pain and that they're feeling, and 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 feel motivated to want to do it. You know, and I think I think it's refreshing. What I think what we're saying here is that you know primarily people are po are driven by wanting to make a difference. I don't think we're questioning that. I think it's just you know I think a lot of executives, leaders are, are very very driven by you know kind of d delivering the numbers and all of that which is which is important in any business or any organization but but also we need to kind of connect them with the emotional realities within the organization as well and i think it's a really important point um so so exploring and getting them to visualize and feel the pain uh, or not the pain but the but the you know the issues that we're trying to get them to be aware of um okay that's cool so that's there, there's some a couple of pri really pr practical examples any any other examples of of what we can do as communicators to to sort of get our leadership you know walking the talk and and coming along standing by us in 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 full spirit and not just in uh, in what they're saying uh, uh, yeah. So one of the things that, uh, I try and remind myself often is years ago I had taken, uh, sales training and it was so helpful, uh, for me. And so one of the things, uh, because what, what is sales, right? We're trying to persuade somebody in something. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, um, that I found impactful and that it always st stuck with me is to set ground rules. And so when meeting with leadership, uh, treat it as a, a sales task when you want to persuade them. Um, mm. so to give you a specific, a specific example, I was trained to, um, to be very clear what the goal was, uh, to be honest. And at the onset of the meeting to set the ground rules, meaning like, uh, hi, Mrs. CEO, 
Um, I know that uh, our stated objective is to increase management diversity 10% by the end of the year. Uh, is that accurate? Are we both on the same page with that goal? And mm. once that's stated, uh, now you've got a little bit of buy-in because they're like, yes, that's what our goal is. And so now it's like, okay, this is what I see. And this mm. is, and then we talk about how to illustrate it, how to make them live the experience. This is what I see. Uh, and I think this is what um, we should do. Mm. Um, one of the things to, to illustrate that a bit deeper is uh, after you and I spoke and then before this podcast, it's not highly scientific, but mm-hmm. I went through a few dozen, I uh, went through LinkedIn and then you know searched, the, went to the different corporate web pages. And I looked at um, the, all, the, all the websites that had the leadership page, which is fairly common. You see it pretty common. Yeah. And so I just put a quick spreadsheet and I looked and it was about, out of these, it was, uh, it was less than two dozen. There was about 70% were you know, white Caucasian leaders Mm -hmm. and, um, the, the round, the rest was, uh, you know, um, maybe white women, but it was very, very, uh, not very representative of, of, of the, of the, of the country of of us as, as a whole. And so that's, uh, that's, a but yet all of them uh, in their job postings and in their about us, they talked about diversity. They talked Mm -hmm. about, uh, how they're progressive and how they're going to do all these great things. So that's something that we can um, help when we have a conversation with leadership is say, hey, this is our page. This is what like is public, which prospective employees and customers uh, are seeing, um, and that this is our message, and this doesn't this doesn't jive. So that's a that's a, a good way to to put a real example that's you know that applies to their life with the actual issue. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good a really good tip for any any communicator is to, is to learn some good sales skills, learn some good influencing skills. Not mm-hmm. and and so you can I think you refer to it, is that is that what you call training upwards? Yeah, as, as a sort of a principle or uh, in, in terms of you know kind of uh, influencing your manager, leading upwards, managing upwards, and and really kind of guiding that agenda and getting people to sort of recognize and reflect on what they're saying and what they're doing which can as we've said is can be often two different things correct yeah, yeah so 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 to tell me a little bit of, I, I know you're um you're, you're kind of developing a new website at the moment uh, do, do you want to tell us a little bit about that what that's going to be what it's called and and what, what you're going to be putting on there because you, outside of your educational work i know you you've got some uh, uh you, you want to kind of be driving this agenda and, and what we've been talking about today through your own website. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that, that, that please, uh, Dean? Uh, yes. So uh, I love teaching and I will stick with it probably, uh, you know, forever. Um, <laughs> however, I'm, uh, I have my feet firmly planted in uh, the corporate world and it's something that is motivating. And I, um, I often, uh, you know, consult with people and help them. And so yeah. one of the things that I'm going to do is, uh, uh, kind of abandon some of my, you know, from my mark on life, abandon the marketing side and focus more on, on the communication side. And mm. as we, uh, we talked about in the, in the past, I, I give every, every message that goes out, every piece of content, I give it, you know, what I call the eye roll test. And yeah. I envision a department, um, every department. And if one of them is going to roll their eyes, I look back and say, well, why would they roll their eyes? Is my content, um, hokey is my content not right, or is it because a deeper problem where they're just simply not going to believe it? And that had led me to say, um, let's highlight the things that I think are important. And some of them we just touched on: hiring, um, remote work, DEI, mm. uh, and, and a few other things. So I uh, started a website called CorporateUprising.com, mm. mm-hmm. where I'm going to focus on uh, those kind of issues, where I will consult with some companies and uh, share my my experiences and, and my thoughts via blog posts. Excellent. Excellent. And we'll, we'll, we'll put a link to that into the, uh, into the show notes uh, amongst some other things. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So I guess just, just summing up then Dean, uh, you know, just a few, you know, give us a kind of few takeaway thoughts, points that you, you, you know, we've either summing up on what we've already said or any, any final tips for anyone listening who's, you know, kind of recognizes that, um, they, they've got, you know, a good leadership team, but who are just sometimes a little bit disconnected from the reality and, and don't always help, you know, kind of get those messages out in the way we want them to get out by either contradicting them through inadvertently or, or just not 
giving it the kind of credibility that it requires. What a final a final couple of tips there, Dean, if if that's okay. Uh, great. So the to summarize, the most important thing that uh, out of what we talked about is to help them live the experience. Mm. Uh, and then once we do that, it, it does make our efforts a little bit more uh, impactful. Mm. Uh, for example, have you ever uh, talked to anybody who went skydiving for the first time? They they talk about how this it's this life changing you know event that have happened to them, but yet as people who haven't been, I haven't been, mm. uh, I can't quite grasp that experience. So yeah. they're clearly motivated and they're excited, and and you know it was an important thing in their life, but yet I I just don't quite get it. And so as a communicator, we have to figure out a way. Hey, how can I take this experience um, and via a story? And tell it to you know my audience, whether that be training up or training down. So I think to to have the, your audience live that experience is is the biggest uh, tip that I would share. Yeah, yeah, I I I, I would concur with that as well. And and uh, you know I, I think there's many many examples, and 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 I think that that for me it's I think you know using the skydiving example is a really good one. Um, and, but I think also sometimes for internal communicators that can feel a little bit uh, you know the, how do I get them to really see and feel what I want them to see and feel? But there are many ways that you can do that, and and I think it's just a case of. Um, looking at what resources you've got and 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 thinking you know you you know there are some things that you just literally can't get them to experience so we're talking from a dni mm -hmm. dni position you know you can't get them to literally feel what it likes to be to be a kind of you know person uh, from a from a my uh, from a, an ethnic minority or whatever living in a, in a in a in a sort of you know an organization but you can get them to relate to some of the the emotions that that, that those people are going through and the, how they're feeling and uh so i think yeah it's it's, it's how do I do that at scale and so I can, you know, not make it overcomplicate it and then, you know, give up because it's too difficult. Um, I think that's really important from my, my point of view. Any, anything else, Dean? Any, any other final points? Uh, just to follow up on what you said, you know, you, you summarized it pretty well. So we can never fully uh, show the experience, no matter how, how great a storyteller I am. I'm not going to be able to express the thrill of jumping out of, uh, of an airplane. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to be uh, creative. And so we, we touched a bit on um, looking at the leadership page um, and then looking at documentation uh, of a, the same organization that talks about um, how much effort they put into, uh, you know, diversity. So that, that, that gets us, maybe it's a baby step, but that is a, a creative way for us to illustrate to leadership, like, Hey, this is, you know, so they're not going to quite remotely experience it, you know, uh, the way we would like them to, but it, it, those kind of creative uh, communication methods really do help us move the needle. Definitely, definitely. Well, look, Dean, that's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you, thank you for sharing those insights. Um, now, in terms of what we're going to put in the show notes, we're going to put a link to your uh, LinkedIn profile. We're going to put a link to the, your new website. We'll also put a link into the article that you mentioned, uh, the the Inc. article. Uh, and if there's anything, is there anything else that uh, you'd like us to share with with the the listeners um, that they can access as well? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Brilliant, brilliant, excellent. Well, thank you for sharing sharing those links in with us, and, and also uh, I'll look forward to having a look at your new website once it's uh, it's it's all up and running. And um, and just to say thank you very much for your time, Dean. And uh, uh, I hope it's uh, you have a you've got the rest of your day to look forward to out there in sunny Arizona or uh, <laughs> relatively sunny Arizona. Yeah, de definitely sunny Arizona. It's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and I wish you all the best for 2022, and hopefully, um, you know it's going to be a, a, an optimist, a re, an optimistic year for the for the world and and everybody in it. At, uh, compared with the last two years we've had, so I really, really wish you all the best, Dean. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Same to you, Craig. Take care. Thank you. Bye. So thank you very much for listening to Engaging Internal Comms. We hope you found this episode useful and interesting. We'd uh, love to get your thoughts about the show and any questions you have or ideas for topics that you'd like to maybe cover in future episodes. You can email us at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk or you can get in touch with us via the contact form 
at engagingic.com. You can also sign up for our mailing list there and we'll send you relevant news about the show, future episodes, and we'll also let you know about anything interesting we found out about internal communications and employee engagement. Uh, If you like the show and you haven't already done so, please subscribe to it via your podcast service. And you can also subscribe via the links on our podcast page, which again is engagingic.com. If you like the show, we'd be really grateful if you could leave us a review. And if you know anyone else who might be interested in the show or might benefit from it, please let them know. Please share it with them and share them the uh, with them the links to the show and engagingic.com. Thank you very much. Thank you.